the cost of regulatory compliance is actually a very important cost that you should not delay, because if you delay, your revenue will disappear suddenly, and your whole company as well. And I, I had that situation with a lot of manufacturers reaching out to me and said to me, Basil, what happened? It's like, why? The notified body pulled our certificate away. I said, are you surprised? Yeah, they were auditing us and they were like, very strict. It's like, this is their job. The same with FDA or other country regulators. This is their job to make sure that the products that are getting on the market are compliant. And if they pull back your certificate, it has a reason. They didn't do it just for fun. And the reason was that you forgot regulatory compliance. And they said, can you tell us what we did wrong? And I started looking to the company and evaluating that, so I went and audited them by myself. I said that when you started the company, like we heard today about innovators, creating a company, starting a company, I said when you started the company, you had a big investment in regulatory and quality. It was a small company, but after one year, you had 12 people working on regulatory and quality. When I got to audit you, how many people were there? One person and 12 marketing. I said, where are the regulatory compliance people? Oh, this is like an unnecessary cost. We try to reduce the cost. So they cut costs on the wrong, wrong place, and they got actually in that problem. And this is important. We spoke about innovation today, and we heard all of that. It's still important, even if it's boring, to recognize what is the regulatory actually obligations that they have to meet. And it's important also for innovative performance of the company, because if you are not looking to continuously improve your devices, this is one of the obligations, you will kill your company by yourself. Basile, please tell us about NDR. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for inviting me to speak here about NDR. So, Regulatory is always boring. I was listening to everyone talking about innovation, investment, getting a company established, and looking to that from a regulatory point of view. Everyone talk about investment, money, getting the money back, getting big revenue, growing as a company, and they forget always market access. And this is a big point, which is also related to European legislation. I deal every day, since many years, with manufacturer. In the past, I was working for a notified body, the biggest notified body in Europe. I established for them the MDR, got it implemented, and then at the end I said to them, guys, now I built everything, everything is ready to run. I will go and help the other side, and I will help the manufacturers understanding how they have to fulfill the requirements. When I get to the other side, people came to me, manufacturers told me, you know, now we're going to tell you the right story. All the time we were telling you how good we are, how big we are, how strong we are, and honestly, we don't have anything of that. And therefore, we need you to get us, to help us to get us there, to get the MDR implementation. A lot of you who are not dealing with regulatory are not perhaps knowledgeable about what is the MDR. But the MDR is the Medical Device Regulation in Europe, which was published in 2017. And it was under discussion since 2012. Why I'm telling you the history? Because we heard about innovation, every company is like looking, how can I get my market to the market? How can I make sure that I keep my product on the market? But everyone, with regard to regulatory aspect, wait till the last minute to react. Because a change means cost. Cost means something I push back. But the cost of regulatory compliance is actually a very important cost that you should not delay. Because if you delay, your revenue would disappear suddenly, and your whole company as well. And I, I had that situation with a lot of manufacturers reaching out to me and said to me, Basil, what happened? It's like, why? The notified body pulled our certificate away. I said, are you surprised? Yeah, they were auditing us, and they were like, very strict. It's like, this is their job. The same with FDA or other country regulators. This is their job to make sure that the products that are getting on the market are compliant. And if they pull back your certificate, it has a reason. They didn't do it just for fun. And the reason was that you forgot regulatory compliance. And they said, can you tell us what we did wrong? And I started looking to the company and evaluating that, so I went and audited them by myself. 
I said that when you started a company, like we heard today about innovators, creating a company, starting a company, I said when you started the company, you had a big investment in regulatory and quality. It was a small company, but after one year, you had 12 people working on regulatory and quality. When I got to audit you, how many people were there? One person and 12 marketing. I said, now where are the regulatory compliance people? Oh, this is like an unnecessary cost. We try to reduce the cost. So they caught cost on the wrong, wrong place, and they got actually in that problem. And this is important. We spoke about innovation today, and we heard all of that. It's still important, even if it's boring, to recognize what is the regulatory actually obligations that they have to meet. And it's important also for innovative performance of the company, because if you are not looking to continuously improve your devices, this is one of the obligations, you will kill your company by yourself. And this is what happened. Historically, you know that a lot of us, uh, we carry Samsung iPhone in hand. Who was actually the market leader? Nokia and Ericsson, they forgot actually improvement and continuous improvement. They are still there, but you don't hear them about them anymore in the cell phone technology because they don't deal with that anymore in the same way like Apple and, iPhone and, and Samsung. So, talking about regulation and talking about European legislation, just to give you an update. Um, I will try to keep it simple for everyone that everyone who's not a regulatory background understand what's happening here. European system is changing and it has already changed. So, we, we have in the past directives and then those directives changed to new regulation. We had in the past, in 2012, 82 notified bodies, 83 notified bodies. Who are notified bodies today? In the US, you have FDA. This is how you get your product approved. In Europe, the European system said, we don't want to do it as a centralized uh, authority. We did centralize. We give it to independent parties, conformity assessment bodies, and we allow them through designation that they are allowed to act on our behalf. So they are like the FDA, but they are in private hands. Now we had 83 notified bodies. Now with the MDR, we just have 28. Why? Because the process of getting a notified body is not anymore that simple like in the past. 56 applied, 28 are there. How long did it did they take to get that? Two years. Every notified body is taking two years from application to designation. Every notified body, and was one of uh, I was working for one of the biggest players there, and I got this, uh, the second designation in Europe at that time. Everyone was increasing resources, but. You do a calculation very easily. You have 83 notified bodies serving the market globally. You get reduction to 28. Even if you increase resources over a period of five years, you will not be able to digest everything immediately. Because capacity, competent people are limited. You can't find them all around. You can't get all these people running and able to deliver services. The second point which is important in the service provider part is that actually you need to train the people. It's not like a machine, you develop it, you verify it, you validate it, you bring it to the market. You need to get the people trained, educated, and FDA is dealing with such a limitation, also the European system is dealing with such a limitation. Years ago, I told every one of us, if you don't have capacity, start training your kids, because their future is a regulatory, is in quality, we're going to need more and more of them. A lot of people didn't listen. They waited. Now the kids have to go to university, you have to pay as well. So you don't have actually the trained qualified people. So we have 28 notified bodies. They have to deal with all of this problem with the MDR. They have to implement the MDR. They have to support everything. The problem that we have in Europe, we are not getting, let's say, a possibility to get all devices still ongoing under the old system. Every device, even if it has been since 50 years on the market in Europe, has to undergo a recertification. So there is no possibility to deviate from this. Every manufacturer, if it's Medtronic or it's Stryker or it's a no-name company, everyone has to start from scratch. So the European market is rebuilding everything. If we look at the system in Europe, we have nearly 10,000 certificates of medical devices getting from out of Europe as well as from European market to the European market. So they need to get the CE market. And all of these companies need to get certified again. So notified bodies. In the past, you could see them in conference like that. So Joe invited me at that time with my notified body responsibility to speak on 10X. Nowadays, if you look to conferences, you'll see some notified bodies presenting. Those are the big players. The other one, they are hiding because they don't have time to be there. They can't spend, re send resources to spend time on conferences. They can't do that because they need every single capacity to digest the work. And also, they don't care anymore. Their sales strategy was in the past they were fighting to get customers. We were doing roadshows at Notified Bodies to get more customers. Now, they sit there and customers are waiting and they can say, 
we have enough. Go away. Go away. And this is what is happening. And what is also happening, the process is getting very lengthy. So if you got a certification application now for the European system, in the past you could do it like, you could do expedited, three months, six months, get your certificate. Now you can apply for expedited, and if you get it, it's, it's a, a really a success story. There is one notified body who will offer it for you. But they will not deliver it in three months or six months. You will need a long time. Typical time to get the product recertified is between 18 months and two years. And even a product which was approved in the European market, and what matters, how much clinical evidence do you have? What matters, did you do your job accordingly in the past? And this is what is leading to a lot of trouble. You see, I told you 10,000 certificates. How many of those do you believe are already and they are now ready? Guess. Give me a number. No, this is... It's actually less than 10% of these 10,000 are even big manufacturers. So, which were telling me at the beginning, we are ready, we're going to submit, we're going to get everything on time. They call me and say, Basile, what's happening? We don't hold even one certificate for the European market. Now, this point is, is interesting because there is an additional burden. The time, the countdown is going down and down and down because we are ending with that transitional provision period in May 2024. So, we still have two years' time. And if you consider that a lot of manufacturers are not certified yet, and 28 notified bodies are not even allowed to start the process, so you recognize that the European system is still in its implementation phase, and a lot of manufacturers will not be able to make that market. So we spoke before about which kind of influence, there was an example of Russia uh, leading to an influence on your business. Did you consider also the influence of not being able to sell in Europe? or? not to sell in other countries which depend on the European CE marking because a lot of manufacturers, they rely on CE marking for a lot of Asian market or Middle East and if you don't have it, you lost your business as well. And this is where a lot of people do not recognize that and do not care about that as well. So, what is the reason for all of this? The reason for all of this, not readiness, no preparation of manufacturer, a lot of people didn't start. We had the COVID situation which led to additional burden because people couldn't travel to do auditing, to do, uh, let's say, the initial steps. But the biggest burden also is, is related to manufacturers who didn't prepare themselves, who didn't take it seriously. In 2012, when the regulation was under preparation, I went out, I was telling people, guys, you need to start collecting clinical data. I was at RAPS, big conferences all over the globe, telling everyone, trying to educate on NDR. And I think I trained thousands of people on NDR. And then, Everyone was telling me, Basile, come on, this will never happen. The European legislator will never implement such a high requirement for Europe. This will be higher than US FDA. They will never do it. What happened? Reality, it's implemented. What happened? Nobody prepared himself. So a lot of manufacturers didn't take it seriously. And now, surprise, surprise, manufacturers get their product rejected. Then they come to me and say, oh, we invested now 500,000 to get our product certified under the NDR, and the result was rechecked. We have to pay for a recheck. It's like, yes, this is uh, reality, because you didn't comply to the new legislation. It's not fun. It's actually a requirement which you have to fulfill in Europe. This is what is actually currently happening with European medical device regulation in Europe. What is the problem? I don't know if people cannot read what is written, or they don't want to read. I know it's boring, but I kept saying you can read the MTR with a glass of wine and it will end with multiple bottles. And as soon as you start feeling the pain, then you got it. Because when you feel the pain, you are getting the message. And the wine will help you because you will get a bit of relief out of that. So read what you have to comply to. Don't just read your numbers because your numbers will be having a minus in front of them if you didn't actually read the obligation that you need to fulfill to be able to place device on the market. You make regulatory pain very entertaining. <laughs> I have to ask, with so few companies prepared, what's the reality? It's not as though Europe is going to say, sorry, 90% of medical devices are no longer available, so... It's a good point, Joe. Uh, I think the legislator today, they tell you, we told you about that years ago. So they will not give advantages, potentially, for all manufacturers. The manufacturers who are perhaps in the application process and they are actually influenced by the fact they try, but they are not able because of delays and so on, then they will get a benefit. 
But the manufacturer board still run like 80% of the industry is still saying, let's wait, perhaps next year we can apply. Okay, let's take that example then. Let's say 50% say, I don't believe you. I'm not doing it. You don't really think that half the products are going off the market. They will take a uh, device or uh, medic. They're going to look to the medical need. They're going to look to those device manufacturer, and they're going to create different rules. So they will not get rid of every device and kill the healthcare system. They will not do it. But they will apply the rules of authorities where they say, okay, uh, we're going to prioritize. We're going to decide, do we need 10 catheters manufacturers, or we take the one who was actually prepared to get his devices marked. I know collusion is not really legal, and yeah. I haven't suggested, but if everyone in, say, orthopedics said, we're not going to do it, we're not going to do it, and then... Yeah, I mean, we, we will see what will happen with such a situation. It could happen. We could come to such a situation that everyone would say, I will not do it. But then you could have also regulators who are saying, okay, we're going to approve device by device, or we we'll give you a big penalty uh, that you have to do it, and you have a short timeline to deliver. If you would not do it, then we create our own solutions or whatever. Because, you know, regulators are, sometimes they create, like, deviation from their own rules, but they don't want actually to blame themselves. They create these rules. If you blame them, they will say, hey, guys, this is not the way that we want to have it. So you're saying, don't call their bluff, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Larry? I think I'm going to contact the, uh, the European regulators and have a great suggestion. It's called an emergency use authorization. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have that. Um, and in Europe, we have 27 member states. You can do that, but then you need to go with your device for every single member state and get the approval. And you need to justify why you didn't do your job accordingly. And then you can get into, I mean, there is always someone who did it. Well, there is someone who prepared themselves. And I'm talking about what Joe's talking about. It's called people not getting therapy and dying because devices are not available. The government cannot ignore that. Agree, agree. And they, they will, will take care of that. They will take care of such a situation. But they will not allow manufacturer to, to play the role of saying, we would not do it because uh, they, this, this will mean that the rules are not followed for that country, which they would not enable. Way. Just to comment on the like the strategics, they won't comply with the MDR. They are all doing it. They're all hiring heads of, yeah. of MDR transition plans. We did a lot of their CER, CEP work. I mean, they're going to do this. The only thing that this is really changing is where start what startups do in Europe. Instead of commercializing in their own country, they come to the US first. Which is happening. This is, this is a major change, so uh, a shift in, in the way how manufacturers are planning the product introduction, so they are deciding to a different market now. But we need to consider also that the fact that um, nobody is taking that that seriously, what is happening in the EU, and this is which is going to punish a lot of manufacturers. And like you said, the big ones, they, they are doing that. They are planning, they are doing, they are not succeeding yet, yeah. because they believe based on their power they can succeed faster, they are not. So they are recognizing we have to do the job in the right way. Now the small uh, players, some of them are perfect because they said we can't afford it. We, we need to get compliance. Some others, they say, oh, let's give it a try. So I have one manufacturer who said to me, you know, I, I just sent them the same documentation which I was sending in the past with the same evidence. I said, let's give it a try. And I required from them that they do this in an expedited way, so I had to pay like four times the price. And then they, they got back to me and said, fine, it's rejected. Why? I just changed the name. It's like, because the rules are different. I mean, you need to read the rules, what they are telling you you have to do. And this is, this is wrong. And those manufacturers will disappear because such an investment, we, we heard about like 1 million revenue, 2 million revenue, 10 million revenue. If you invest like 500,000 just for an approval and you get a reach out, where do you get this money back? So you need to get that to recover as well. I asked Maurizio, I asked Daniel, you must have more companies coming at you than you could possibly support. I agree. And this is how do you choose who you will help? I mean, uh, what we do is like we have uh, the selection of companies uh, who we're going to help, who will not help. I do not help companies that are not willing to be compliant. So they are not willing to listen. So companies that say, I want you to help us to get into compliant uh, strategy, I have that. But you have, I get a lot of requests of companies saying to me, tell me how I can avoid the compliance. And they say, you know, I can't do that because you can't avoid it. I can build for you a strategy which is lean, I can get you like a, a prioritization to get your submission done, but I can't get you non-compliant product on the market because I can't sleep at, at night when I know that that product is not compliant. This is what we need to keep in mind as well. Hi, so Karen Deepia, as a quality regulatory consultant, 
which areas should I be focusing on when seeing a client? What are the common mistakes that you see in terms of companies losing their seed market? I will show you that in some minutes. So this is what I'm planning to share with you as well. So the NDR is nothing actually, which is, I, I was surprised that people are telling me like the NDR is very complex. A lot of things are like overdoing. There's a lot of expectation on documentation, which you should have as a manufacturer. And every time when you do something in a regulated field, you should document why you're putting that decision. I think Rob and Michelle uh, uh, told you a bit about that when we were speaking about FDA. So nothing unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. The big problem, sorry, it's like jumping. The big problem is like people start with the first point, which is saying the European legislation is saying you need to know how you are getting your product to the market, your supply chain. You need to know how they communicate with you. People forget, for example, to have contractual agreement with them. They don't know who are the distributors. Today in the morning before coming to the conference, a manufacturer was telling me, yeah, we sell millions of devices. Like, how do you sell them to the European market? Oh, we don't know. It's like, uh, you have to have a first point of selling. How does it work? Where, who is distributing your product? Yeah, we have someone who's one distributor, but he's not distributing, he's giving that to further distributors. It's like, you need to build like clarity about your supply chain because you need to make sure that you mitigate the risk. If there is something going wrong, then you need to know where is this happening. They don't know that. So the, the first important thing is like economic operators. Who is part of my supply chain? As a non-European manufacturer, you would need an authorized representative, you would need an importer, you need the distributors as well. You need to build contractual agreement with them. You need to understand what they are doing. You need to set obligation, duties and responsibilities. And guess what? It is also in the US the same thing. It's the same thing that you need to do in every quality management system. But people do not recognize it, and suddenly they say, oh, we have to have that. You will not even order something without a contractual agreement. Whatever it is, consumer, you do a contract as well. But they forgot that. The other point which is important, and I just get on a high level to share with you some important information, which are not new. A quality management system, which includes everything what Michelle was mentioning during her presentation and Rob, is a minimum. Guess what? A lot of companies suddenly now they are like saying, oh, we didn't have a gap. It's like, what? Why you didn't have a gap? Yeah, nobody asked us for this. It's like, uh, do you have documentation for your device design? No, we lost them because we moved multiple places and we don't know where they are now. Uh, and, and those are US companies, Asian companies, European companies, and sometimes, who is a big name? You know, it's like, how could it be that you lose documentation? Yeah, we did a lot of acquisition and suddenly we just forgot that we need to have also the documentation with our acquisition. So we took actually the financial part, the product, but we forgot actually the remaining part, which is critical. The other important is the thing which is actually critical when you see a lot of gaps, risk management. How is risk management done? From the beginning and never stopping. This is where actually it shouldn't be with NDR, but this is where they are identifying gaps. The biggest gap which you can see, clinical. Everyone was comparing apples with oranges and saying the apple is an orange, but the orange doesn't have even evidence. And they were like trying to get those products on the market. Now, the mentality of equivalency in the US differ from the European equivalency approach. They are not the same. You can't apply the same mentality. And especially for US manufacturer, this was actually uh, the strategies that they were pushing for, like 510k process, it doesn't work for Europe. You need to do it in a different way, and this is where a lot of people are getting now into trouble, because they recognize we need to do something in a different way. The other big part which I want to share with you is actually the post-market. Post-market surveillance obligations are actually obligations which you have to do throughout the entire lifetime of a device, and this is where most of the manufacturers are not doing that. And they see this as a big investment, and they see this as just an investment. They don't see the add value of post-market surveillance. I, I sell regulatory as not actually a burden for a company. Regulatory is actually an add value for a company, for a continuous improvement. And why shall you sell a stand where you have just one year data? Why don't you think about how can I make clinical studies to collect more data or establish a registry to collect more data to use them for my marketing strategy as well, not just for my regulatory compliance. How can I use them to impress, to show add value, to show why you should buy my device? And this is where people forget it. They see it always, we are just doing this. I, I remember in the past, uh, some CEOs came to me when I was at the Notified Body, they said, Dr. Akra, we are doing all of this just for you. It's like, oh, thank you. It's like, this is big. I, I'm so impressed, so thanks for that. They don't get the point that actually, this is actually for their own risk mitigation, business risk mitigation, as well 
design, continuous improvement, and sales strategy. So you do that not just for making the regulator happy, you do that to show compliance and to make sure that you are protecting yourself in case something happens. Also a big issue which is leading to a lot of trouble is actually the fact that manufacturers were doing private labeling uh, of other devices, so there was an original equipment manufacturer, and they were like using that device and putting a, their label on it and say they are the legal manufacturer, and they had no access to any information, and this kind of devices they will disappear now with European uh, legislation because the legislation is saying if you want to do that you need to have full access to the full documentation of your predecessor device, and if you don't do that then you will not be able to get to the market. This is what is becoming now burdensome for a lot of manufacturers. Another important part, which is critical, you ask me what will happen in audit, you're going to get to a manufacturer, you're going to see, you're going to ask them, what is your regulatory strategy? So I think uh, some of you uh, spoke about pathway, regulatory pathway. The strategy of manufacturer to get a device on the market, no manufacturer has it. No one. MDR requires every manufacturer to have a regulatory strategy for their device. They expect them to develop a clinical strategy as well to document that. Everyone say we want to have something for the future, but they don't document, they don't have evidence. Qualification of personnel uh, involved in regulatory. Not everyone can be a regulatory professional. Most of the companies they are hiring from university, which is great. I'm supportive for junior newcomers, but you need to have also some senior leadership in your company. You can't just get someone from a university who never had any idea about regulatory and give them the task and say you are now the full qualified person. You need to select the right persons. You can't have an orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, evaluating the clinical data of a uh, heart valve. Even if he's a physician, he's not qualified. He can't do that. It's not like per definition, because I'm a physician, I can do everything. Other things which are leading to a lot of problems is actually capacity, resources, hiring, where I'm hiring people, where are those people, uh, how much time are they spending for that work. And a lot of people forget all of that. They, they also involve suppliers and they say, we, we don't want to do the task internally. We got to be our RC person responsible for compliance. We take an external one. But that external one is serving 20 manufacturers, and this is one single person. Does it make sense? No, it doesn't. So they are getting nonconformity. It doesn't work. You can't get one person serving hundreds of manufacturers for getting the obligation of the regulation. So there is a lot of things. I don't want to go into the details, but I just want to tell you, if you want to succeed, and it is doable, so to get to your point back, it's not something which is like unknown. FDA does the same thing. The same requirement are in the US. They are named differently, perhaps. They are referring to... Uh, different legislations, but you have the same requirement. And I'm surprised that everyone is seeing that as a big burden, because if you could prepare early, you could avoid a lot of costs. Now, manufacturer comes to me and says, like, our certificate is ending in six months, can you rescue us? It's like, what did you do? Nothing yet. <laughs> then you get in and say, like, uh, how many devices do you have? Oh, we have like 25 devices, and uh, we have uh, five uh, manufacturing facilities. Okay? If you do something on a quality management system, um, we have in some facilities a good quality management system, so we have a certificate, but we didn't look to gaps or NDR. So you start with this, and then you recognize, actually, you need a lot of people to start doing the 25 technical documentation to get them, all of them ready and up to date. Some of them, they would ask me, would it be possible just to send them and say, like, let's get a waiver and say it's fine? No, you would not do it because the cost of correction is higher than the cost of actually doing this in the right way. If you do it from the beginning right, you, it costs you one dollar. But if you correct afterward, it will cost you millions because you need to go back and back and back and you're going to lose time. And time is money and a lot of people do not get that point. Standards. Uh, we were like talking about a lot of standards and how the uh, U.S. has standards and other regions have standards and guidance. And I was smiling when Michelle and Rob were presenting saying people did try to, to negotiate with them about usage of standard and guidance and whether those are like binding. Now the European legislator, I remember when we got the regulation published, I was invited to the European uh, uh, Commission meeting in Brussels and the Commission presented about the NDR and they were like presenting and impressed by the new legislation to say this is a good new document finally published, which was a good step finally. And I had to present from my side, and it's like I presented the legislation, I said those are 175 pages, which are written in a very small, tiny size. Uh, if you read the regulation one time, you will understand nothing. If you read it multiple times, you will recognize that it's actually unclear at all, and you will need a lot of guidance. The commission was saying at the beginning, we wrote the regulation in a very lengthy way because we wanted to avoid guidance, we want to be clear and be very specific. 
How many guidelines do we have to now for the European medical device regulation? The regulation on itself, if you print it in a normal uh, page and, and with a normal size or font size, you will get 500 pages. Since its publication, we got nearly 80 guidance documents, and every guidance is between 10 and 30 pages, explaining what is written in five sentences in the regulation. So every five sentences are leading now to 30 pages of explanation. Now, the good thing is of guidance is actually you get a bit more clarity, but the bad thing is like, you know, every legislator, when they are trying to explain to you what they meant with three sentences, they include a new requirement, which makes your life not easy. Industry was shouting, we want to have more guidance, more clarity, we can't start because we don't have guidance. Now they got the guidance and everyone is crying and saying, oh God, the guidance are expecting from us to do more and more. So this is, this is problematic. Often, uh, I, when I am asked or give unsolicited advice to speakers, you know, some come up and they say, let me tell you about my company and this and that. And I say, no, just go up. Show them that you know what you're talking about. And they're like, oh, I know a guy. You have done that in spades. And very entertaining. And so well dressed. <laughs> Thank you. And you flew from Germany, for which I'm very grateful. I would close by asking you to tell the camera for those watching later. If you've not yet gotten started, of course you're going to say, get started right away. But is there something specific, like where do I start? Because calling you is a nice choice, but it's impractical for 80% of the companies to call you. What do we need to do now? Start with your gap assessment. This is what you have to start. And look to your capacity, resources, if you have enough resources. If you don't have, hire them or involve consultants to support you on that. Basile Agra is my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Basile Agra. Thank you.